Thanks, Kirsch. All right, this morning I'm going to be talking about priorities, <coughs> setting the right priorities and what order we should have them in. Um, I think it's sometimes quite an obvious thing, but sometimes as Christians we just need to be reminded that what comes first. But see, setting the right priorities or having the right priorities in your life helps you with decision making, right? It helps, it makes sure that the important things get done first because you know we don't have unlimited time we don't have all you know we don't live you know for eternity so we have to prioritize our time we have to prioritize the things in our life and uh, that's what I'll be talking about this morning we'll be talking about the order we should be prioritizing things and going over some examples as well hopefully it's a blessing for you this morning all right so the first thing and it's <coughs> self-explanatory now, the thing that we put first, number one, is God. Right? We put God first. And even though it's quite obvious that as Christians, we should put God first, that's not always the thing that Christians do. This is why I'm telling you this morning as a reminder that Christians don't always put God first in their life, but He indeed should be first and foremost in our life. Uh, we read in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So a couple of things I want to talk about in this <coughs> passage here. If you looked at the context when we read through Matthew 6, you can see that because a lot of people, they talk about this passage and they just quote it, just meaning whatever they want, right? So when they say, hey, all these things shall be added unto you, this is not just like saying all the desires of your heart and all the things that you want and all the things that you desire and lust after. No, in Matthew 6, it's talking about the things that you need, clothing and food, our basic necessities. And it's saying, hey, we ought not to worry about our basic necessities. Yeah, we do what we can to, to provide for ourselves, but we're not full of care, like, like Jesus talks about. We need to be full of care for seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So there are two things as well here, because sometimes people think, oh, seeking first the kingdom of God... They just, it's just this nebulous thing where they're just emotionally, oh, I'm just seeking God, I'm just you know, thinking about Him all the time. No, it's, it's not just that. It's, that's why it mentions here, and His righteousness. So part of seeking God first is doing what God wants us to do. Right? So seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, what are these things? It's the food and the clothing, our basic necessities, shall be added unto you. So the idea in this passage is... What should our focus in life be? Our focus in life should be in serving God, right? Seeking first the kingdom of God. Not seeking second, not seeking third, not seeking, you know, once you've done everything you want to do and then with the time left, oh, I've got some time spare, now I'm going to seek the kingdom of God. And the Bible's saying here you seek first the kingdom of God. So our number one priority in our life and the purpose of our life is to serve God and to try and get more people into the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So you see, even things as mundane as eating and drinking, the Bible's telling us here, God should be on our mind, right? We should be considering what does God want and you know, how should we be doing things according to God's will, even in the event of eating and drinking. And, and, and here, you know, in the context, it's talking about you know, maybe eating things sacrificed to idols and the situations that you find yourself in. Even then, we need to prioritize God. So that's why our priorities matter, because we have to decide by level of importance, what are we going to prioritize or put first over other things? And like I'm saying, obviously in the Christian life, God comes first. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is, look at this, the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all 
the law and the prophets. So, yeah, it's a beautiful thing that Jesus is able to sum up all of God's commandments in two statements, and that's to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And again, you know, I just like to iterate that, you know, love is not just this, ne- you know, just this emotion, just this feeling, just saying, oh, I just love everyone so much, but then you don't actually do right by them. But how do we do right by them? Look at what Jesus says in verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the way we love people is we need to keep God's commandments. So you can't love people when you're not keeping God's commandments. And and this ties in as well with our priorities. We have God first. So that enables us to love the things, the other things that we're going to be talking about this morning is we need to have God first because to show true love towards other people, we need to know God. I was saying to the kids this morning, we need to know God first before we can put God first. So you need to know God, you need to know his commandments to know how to love, to, to love others. Because otherwise people you know, create their own way of loving. You know, they think that this is something loving and, and it's not necessarily according to God's will. Um, so let's talk about some examples. Some examples of how do we put God first. Well, I think one of the most important is with our time. Right? How do we put God first with our time? How do we set our schedule where God comes first? Well, think about how you set your schedule. Do you set your schedule where you do everything you want to do? Like I I talked about this just earlier on. Do you figure out all the things you want to do first? You fill out your schedule and then you go, all right, now what time do I have for God? All right, oh, I've got a Sunday free here. Maybe I'll go to church. You know, oh, I've got this time free here. You know, I'm not doing anything on this Sunday afternoon. Maybe I'll go somewhere. You know, after you've filled out your schedule with everything else that's important. Is that putting God first? No. How do we set our schedule to put God first? It's when we schedule the spiritual events first. We say, okay, we know we're at church every week. That's going on Sunday. You know, whatever you decide with your ministries and things like that, other things you do for God, you might say, well, I'm going soul winning every week. I'm going soul winning every other week. I'm going to make sure I go at least once a month. So you schedule that one in. And then, you know, there might be other things that you want to prioritize to do with church or to do with service, to do the things that you're doing for God. And then you are then working around that schedule. So you have your priorities first, and then you try and fit in the other things. So this is what we mean by priorities. Which one do you prioritize over another? Do you prioritize, oh, these are the things I want to do, and then I got to try and fit in all things God around that, or hey, these are the things for God, and then I'm going to try and fit in my recreational activities and all the things I want to do around those things, right? So spiritual commitments are like church, your evangelism, you know, prayer time, things like this, right? There's no such thing as too busy. You know, I know we all use that excuse, right? We all say, oh, I'm too busy to do this, too busy to do that. But, you know, all of us have 24 hours in a day, right? All of us can find the time when what? When something is important enough, right? When something's important enough, you find the time, don't you? So that's why I was always taught, you know, there's no such thing as too busy. There's only important and not important, right? And you need to make sure you get the important things done first. Because we're not going to have time, you know, anyone can fill their life with just endless amounts of activity. You know, there's, there's plenty of things to do in this world to fill in 24 hours a day. And remember, a third of it's already gone because you spend a third of it sleeping, and then you've got travel time, and then you've got eating time, and then you've got, you know, all the other stuff. You know, you may, maybe you've got work as well. It's the whole chunk gone as well. So there's not really that much discretionary time outside of that, right? And anyone can fill that time with all sorts of things. The question is, what is important enough to take up that time first, right? So it doesn't get crowded out with the less important things. So there's no such thing as too busy, right? It's only important or not important, right? Now, it's good to be busy, with a lot of important things in your life, right? Things of eternal value, right? Things that are more important than others. But unfortunately, too often, or more often than not, we fill our lives with a lot of unimportant things, and then we leave the important things undone, right? So not only with your time, right? With your money as well, right? So giving. You always want to make sure you've got some money to put aside to contribute to God's work. 
You know, it's, it's such a shame in, in Christianity that, you know, you see the false religions out there, you know, doing all sorts of great things and, and their people are so much more faithful to giving than true Bible-believing Christians. I mean, you see, like, how many mosques keep going up, right? And you think, well, they're worshipping, like, a false god, a false prophet, and yet they are so much more committed to their false religion than Bible-believing Christians, right? So it's the same with our giving as well. We need to make sure that we put aside money to contribute to God's work because, yes, it does require some material um, resources as well before just spending all the money on yourself, right? Now, I don't personally believe that, you know, tithing is something of the New Testament, but whatever amount you decide, you should prioritize that. Like every Christian, it shouldn't be like when you give to God's work, it's just, oh, the, the weeks that I remember, right? It shouldn't just be, oh, I've just got some spare cash. Yeah, yeah, just, maybe I'll put it in the kitty. Now, the, 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 the attitude of the Christian should be, look, this is my budget. This is what I'm going to commit to God's work. And then that's going to go out first, right? So this is how Christians should do their budget, right? It's not just a, an afterthought. Are you prioritizing God with your time? Are you prioritizing God with your material possessions as well? Because this is how Christians should think. If you don't think that way, this is how Christians should think. If we're prioritizing God with our resources, we look at our budget, we make sure. Because you probably do that in other areas of life, right? Make sure I've got enough for the rent. Make sure I've got enough for the food. Make sure I've got enough for the holiday. Make sure I've got to put my boat payment on. Make sure I put my motorcycle payment. Make sure my car payment. Make sure, you know, putting all those aside. Do you have a bucket where you say, hey, I'm making sure I'm giving to God's work? right? If you don't, we should have one. This is how we prioritize the things of God. How else do we, should we prioritize God in our life? Well, think about this. What about godliness over earthly success or acceptance, right? How often, you know, just in our personal lives, are we ashamed to let people know we're a Christian? You know, they ask us, you know, everyone's been in this situation, you know, they ask you, what did you do on the weekend? I, do you feel that shame to say, I was at church. I would go to church on Sunday. You know, I went to church. I've got church ministry. And you know what? My advice to you is, like, it, it's those sort of, uh, sort of social interactions where you're a little bit ashamed to say you're a Christian, you just got to get over that barrier, right? That only happens, I feel, if... At the beginning, you know, when you, maybe when you're, you're a new Christian or you first start going to church and you're telling people, but the, you just got to sort of break the ice, if you know what I mean. Because every Christian feels that way because they kind of feel like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm a holy, you know, holy, holy. You know, everyone's had those thoughts, right? But you know what? Just own it. You know, just be that ambassador for Jesus and just say, yeah, I'm a Christian, right? And you know, you get boldness from knowledge. That's, that's, that's me personally, right? Me personally, I feel... The bolder, the bolder I get, the more I know God's word, the more I can defend God's word, the more like, I have reasons for why I do things in my life. And if, the, if I, this is me personally, everyone gets boldness from different areas, but for me personally, the, just the more I know, the more I can um, you know, answer things or reason and rationalize things, I'm more bold to tell people about them. Why? Because sometimes people don't want to... Um, tell people that they're a Christian or they go to church. Because why? Because maybe they're going to ask you about it. And God, God forbid they'll ask you about it. And then now you're going to have to like maybe explain some things. You know, like, you know, why is church important? Or why do you spend so much time going to church? Why do you do it? You know, and, and I think if you are not comfortable talking about those things, and this is why soul winning is good, because you go out and you, you converse with people, you put yourself in an uncomfortable situation with strangers, so that when you talk to your colleagues and family and things like this come up, you're a bit more confident about it. Why? Just because you've done it more often. So, you know, there's always going to be that uncomfortableness at the beginning when you start being a bit more open about being a Christian. But you've got to break that ice. You've got to get through that barrier, right? And once you do, and it just rolls off the tongue, then when people ask you what you do or who you are or what you do on the weekend, then you just tell them. And in fact, it, then it opens up opportunities to talk about it because maybe if they ask you about it, that's, that's an easier way to start the conversation. When they're asking, then it is for you to bring it up, right? So, you know, I think it's, you're missing out on opportunities if you're not bold about who you are, bold about what you believe, 
And sometimes, you know, this is where, you know, when it comes to our reputation and things like that, you know, are we putting, you know, earthly things above God, right? So even when it comes to, you know, when we want to interact with people, do they know you're a Christian? And this is one way you can put God above other things, right? In terms of your own, uh, uh, your own reputation, okay? So putting God first. Let's go on to the second one. Number two. Number two is family. Now, I want to define family because nowadays when we, when we use the word family, people include, you know, siblings, they include, you know, extended family, cousins, you know, like in-laws, you know, extended family, things like that. When I talk about prioritizing family here in this particular, uh, particular topic, right, when I say second to God, I'm talking about husband and wife, parents and children. Right? I wouldn't even necessarily include siblings here because I would put siblings a bit further down, uh, further down the rung. But in terms of the priorities that God wants us to have, I would say when I'm talking about immediate family, I'm talking about husband and wife, I'm talking about your parents and your children, right? Your, your relationship with your children. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Sought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. For this, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So we have a responsibility to our immediate family, right? And what we, talk, what we see here in Ephesians 5 is the responsibility that a husband has to his wife and a wife to her husband. So I believe that you know, these particular familial relationships, right, these family relationships come above, you know, even, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, right, our immediate, these immediate family. Why? Because, you know, husbands, husbands are commanded to die for their children, right? Like wives are commanded to obey their husbands like they obey the Lord, right? These, these relationships are quite high up. Now, if I was to rank you know, let's say the relationship between a husband and a wife, relationship between parents and children, and then relationship between you and your parents, how, how would I rank those? Well, I would put husband and wife number one, right? In, in, you know, obviously you have God at number one, and then you have spouses. Now, why is the relationship between husband and wife more important even than the relationship between parents and children? Well, because I'm not, I'm not commanded to die for my children. Right? But I am commanded to die for my wife. Now, does that mean parents don't, aren't willing to die for their children? No, of course, parents may love their children enough to be willing to give up their life for their children. But what I'm saying is we are commanded in Ephesians 5 to give our life for our wife like Christ gave his life for the church. Right? And that same thing is not said about our children. Right? We're just to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I think there is a higher prioritization for the spouse relationship to the children relationship. And why is this important? Because sometimes uh, parents, you know, will say things to themselves like, I would do anything for my children, right? And, and that's good if they feel that way. But let me ask you, do you feel the same way about your spouse? Would you say, I would do anything for my spouse? I would do anything for my wife? I'd do anything for my husband? Because you should be prioritizing, like we have that same attitude with God, but do anything for God, right? Do we have that same attitude with our spouse? 
because we should have that attitude towards our spouse even more so than we have towards our children. So if we're talking about levels of priority, God, spouse, children, you know, if you have a great love for your children, even more so you should have a greater love for your spouse, right? Because your spouse should be a higher priority. Ephesians 6, <coughs> children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we have a few you know, familial relationships there, talking about you know, the, the parents here. Yeah, so obviously you have your relationship with your children, you have your children's relationship with your parents, and you have your relationship with your parents, and then you've got children. So it starts getting quite complex, right? But if we know how to prioritise these, then we can decide when we're making decisions in our life which one goes over another. 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, we see here, what I wanted to talk about here is when we see here in Ephesians 6, we want children to obey parents. Now, sometimes people misunderstand this and they just think we always obey our parents in everything, right? Which is not the case, right? This is saying children obey your parents. Now, the Bible doesn't set a specific age when somebody stops being a child, but there is a difference between a child obeying their parents and adults being able to make their own decisions and may go against their parents' wishes. That's not necessarily um, uh, sinful, right? Now, I know sometimes parents will use these verses to like guilt trip their children into like doing whatever they want them to do by saying, doesn't the Bible say, honour your father and mother? Now, that doesn't mean that you do whatever your mum and dad wants, right, regardless of the situation. Right? Why? Because you have priorities in life. Right? You've got to think God first. Sometimes I have to do what's right by my children and my family, my spouse, before you know, uh, obeying, or not obeying, but honouring my father and mother. Now, as a child, when you're not an adult, you don't have your own children, yeah, if you live in your parents' home, you have to obey your parents, and that's commanded by God. But that's not the same as honouring thy father and mother. You know, there is an element of respect here and reverence for your father and mother, but you can respect authority without necessarily doing always what that authority is saying to do, right? So this is, this is talking about respect, but honour is more than just respect, right? When, when the Bible talks about honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment we've promised, that it may be well with thee and thou mayst live long on the earth, this is not just talking about reverence and respect. And this is why I want to show you in 1 Timothy 5. Honour in the Bible is also talking about providing for them, right? Providing for their needs when they need them. The same word is used for church leadership too, when you, you honour those you know, that, that, are, that rule in the church. Right? The same, uh, it's, it says, uh, you know, those, um, what does it say, those that rule, I'm trying to remember exactly the wording now, it's lost me, you know, counted, uh, counted worthy of double honour, especially they that labour in the word and in doctrine, right, when it talks about church leadership. But the same passage is used here, when it talks about honouring widows, Honour widows that are widows indeed. But if any man have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So you know, a lot of people use this passage about providing for your family. In the context of this passage, it's talking about providing for those in need at the church and providing for the widows that work for the church. And it's saying, hey, if you don't provide for them, then you're worse than an unbeliever. But notice how it ties it in with honouring widows. So honouring widows is not just about showing them respect and not providing for their needs. It's about you know, actually uh, providing for their needs. And that's the same when it comes to honouring our father and mother. Look here in uh, Matthew 15, what Jesus says. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not, not their hands when they eat bread. 
But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, there's that word again, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So what is their tradition here? Their tradition is that they give their parents something and then they say, hey, this is a gift I'm giving to you. And right? what is a gift? A gift is an unmerited, it's by grace, right? Something given to them that they didn't necessarily deserve. And Jesus is saying here, no, like the things that you give back to your father and mother and you just say it's a gift and you're being profited by me, he's saying, no, honoring them is that you actually, you know, you are obliged to pay back you know, and, and honour your father and mother, provide for them in their times of need. Um, if you're not like sort of debt free from your parents. So it's an interesting concept in the Bible and it's, it's to make sure that parents in their old age are taken care of, right? It's not this idea that, you, you know, the government takes care of you and, you know, the government, you know, gives you this pension and everything and government takes care of your parents. The idea in the Bible is that children were meant to take care of their parents and they were actually obligated to do so. Right? And that's part of the commandment of honouring your mother and father. So, how would I rank ch uh, spouse, and then you got your parents, and then children? I would rank it spouse first, then your children, and then your parents, which might be pretty obvious, but I just wanted to show you passages like this in the Bible. But we do have an obligation to our parents. Um, why would I say children above parents? Because look, in 2 Corinthians 12, I'll show you this verse. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So we think about financial responsibility. The Bible is saying here, it's, it's first and foremost the responsibility of parents to take care of their children and not the other way around, even though we have an obligation to look after our parents, right? But first and foremost, the parents should lay out for the children, right? The parents should look after the children's well-being as opposed to the children looking after the parents' well-being. So that's why I think if I was to rank them, it would be spouse first, looking after your children second, and then looking after your parents third. Now, what are some other examples? So we looked at Matthew 15, where Jesus talks about putting your tradition over God's commandment. So this is how sometimes people put their family over God, right? Because God should be first and then family second. But one way people put their family over God is that they'll, you know, they'll, they won't put Bible teaching over family traditions. You know, sometimes you come from a false religion. Sometimes you come from a, from a culture that has pagan practices, right? There's things like that in Asian culture too. And sometimes in our family, we just continue to blindly follow these practices, right? And this is one area of our life where we're not putting God first because Bible teaching and Bible truth and Bible doctrine should come above just family traditions that we're just following blindly. And sometimes people will put those family traditions to the expense of what they know to be true. And that is one way that we put family uh, above God. What about the situation where, you know, people always ask, ask this situation where they say, well, what if your authority doesn't allow you to obey God? You know, the classic example might be, you know, your father or your husband doesn't allow a wife or a child to go to church or to read the Bible. Now, this is not necessarily a black and white situation, but if we were to think about priorities, well, what would be the right answer? If you're able to do so, you should still go to church, right? You know, so you say, well, I should obey my parents. If your parents tell you don't read the Bible, don't go to church, well, you should try and still do it, right? But you want to still honour your mother and father in the sense that show respect in the way you do it. Now, if you now add violence into the situation, well, that's a little bit different, right? So if, if, there's, if, if somebody, like, life is at risk, or they, there's domestic violence involved, well, that's a whole other situation which may need to be dealt with a different way. But in the, in the general, 
you know, where it's just, well, your parents don't approve of it or they don't like you doing it, they're not stopping you, you should still do it. But you try and still have that good relationship between your parents or between your spouse to say, to get them to understand this is why you're, you're prioritizing me, why these things are important. So you try and go about it in a way where you can still respect your authority even though you may be disobeying them when you're trying to put God first. Other ways, you know, families put um, family above God. Right? There's, there's a ton of family events all the time. You know, it might be birthdays, anniversaries, maybe family holidays where you skip church. Right? I think church should be a priority where you make sure you're always in church. Like even when I travel with my family, you know, there were, there's been very rare times where I've missed church here. You know, but there was one time when I went to Perth and I was there for two weeks to visit family. It was a bit of a holiday for my family. And while I was away, some of the guys preached here and took care of things. But, you know, when I was on holiday, did I just go, oh, I'm on holiday, well, therefore I don't need to be in church? No, I made sure wherever I go holiday, I know where I'm going to be in church. So when I go to Perth, there's somewhere that I go to church there, you know, and I try and get involved with the activities there where I'm in church. Yes, I'll go to some of their prayer meetings, I'll go to the, these events, or we'll go to church, and we'll take our kids to their kids' club there, right? So we don't break, we're trying, to, we're trying to make sure our family understands that just because we're on holiday, that doesn't mean God takes a back seat, right? When I go on holiday, part of prioritizing God, you know, I'm doing something for my family, Prioritize going to make sure when I go on holiday, are the spiritual things taken care of, right? Do we make sure that we're at church even where we go? If we can't, well, maybe, you know, we, we stop off somewhere where there is church. You know, I won't just be on the campsite for two weeks over the weekend. You know, when we go camping, we go like Monday, Thursday, make sure we're back for the weekend. Or we can be somewhere on the weekend where we can go to church. So when we're planning holidays, do we prioritize God, even though we want to do something for our family. And other ways, you know, school or sports events for children on Sundays, that's another way. See, every time we skip church to do something else, we are showing our children, we're showing by our own example that God's not important enough. See, it's like we went on a, we went on a trip, but God wasn't important enough for us to even take into account that we need to be at church. You know, we, we do it, we, we, we get involved in an activity but God wasn't important enough for us to consider how that's going to affect our weekends, right? So this is ways that we don't prioritize God above things that we do for our family. All right, number three. Number three is spiritual family. Spiritual family. Mark 3. Here's a situation with Jesus. Then came, there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. So this is Jesus preaching here, Right? And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. So you can see here that where, how Jesus, you know, his, his priority in terms of like, you know, his, his real family. I mean, his real family is like outside, his brothers and his sisters, even his mother, right? So, you know, maybe we need to change up the, the, the order here, right? And even his mother's outside, and he's saying, well, who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. So this is why you say, Victor, why didn't you include siblings in family? Well, because... Jesus put his spiritual family above his siblings. And sometimes that happens in your life. I mean, as you grow as an adult, right, and you start prioritizing certain things, you start looking after, you know, the things that are within your circle. And you may not have the relationship you had with your brothers and sisters growing up because, you know, they may not even be believers anymore, right? But who should we prioritize? Above our extended family. It should be the family of God. Look at Luke 11, verse 27. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. And he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So that's interesting, because I mean, I, I, was, I was thinking in this sermon, you know, like we say spouse, children, parents, 
But while we have an obligation to our parents, I mean, Jesus is even saying here, above our parents, we prioritize our spiritual family, right? Look at what it, Jesus is saying here in Luke 11. In Luke 11, somebody is saying to Jesus, hey, some, they're basically uh, like a Catholic in the Bible, right? Like a Catholic who's praising Mary. I'm right? saying, blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. What is he saying? How blessed is Mary, the mother that carried him and the mother that was able to breastfeed the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at Jesus' response to it. But he said, yea, rather, more important than that, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So you see, Mary is not blessed just because she was the carrier and the breastfeeder of Jesus. She's blessed because she's a believer. You know, she rejoiced in God, her Savior. And Jesus is saying here, even more so, that physical relationship between him and Mary was not more important than the spiritual relationship between his brothers and sisters in Christ. Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household. Of faith. So Jesus wants us to be good to everyone, but especially more important, prioritizing above is those who are of the household of faith. Now, this is not an easy one to hear, right? Because a lot of people they put their carnal relationships, you know, their physical relationships, over their spiritual relationships. But that ought not be the case, right? The, the way it should be for Christians, we ought to see our brothers and our sisters in Christ as a stronger bond, a more important bond than those we have even blood relationships with, carnal relationships, right? So, what are some examples of Christians, you know, neglecting their um, spiritual family for extended family, right? Well, sometimes... Oh, actually, I want to talk about maybe some examples where people um, uh, do the opposite, where they, where, they, where they neglect their family, number two, for their spiritual family, right? Because we're not talking about the, the other two yet. So some examples where Christians neglect their spouse, their children, for their spiritual family. So remember, we've got God, and we've got our immediate family, spouse, and children, and then we have our spiritual family, right? But what are some examples where Christians prioritize number three above number two? Because that sometimes happens where, you know, people, you know, they think they're so spiritual that they neglect their actual, you know, wife and kids or they neglect their husband and kids. And one example is when you commit to too much ministry, right? So sometimes, sometimes the problem in Christianity is Christians aren't doing any ministry. But then you have the other extreme as well, where Christians commit to too much. You know, and in some churches, there's just too much to do, too many events, too many things to organize, to the point where you don't spend any time with your spouse, you don't spend any time with your children. And that is not a good way either. You know, and you see that with very, very committed people, right? Where they commit in the wrong areas of life. It can happen in church. It can happen in business. It can happen at work, right? And you think that person has it all together, but then their marriage falls apart. You know, their children grow up and they're resentful. They hate, it's like they don't even, because they never had any relationship with their children. You know, just because you're a Christian parent and you put your children in Christian things, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a good relationship with your spouse or a good relationship with your children. Because sometimes what people think when they say, oh, you know, I've got a Christian marriage, I've got a Christian family, is that they went to church and that they put their kids in Sunday school, they put their kids in the Christian school, they put their kids in the Christian daycare, but they never even actually had any, spent any time with their children because they were too busy doing their own things. And these things might be good things. You know, you can even fill your life with too many good things, right? Like being too busy with church commitments where you neglect your family, right? So set an example for your family, but don't neglect them, right? You don't want to you don't want to prioritize spiritual family over your wife and children. And then the last one we have is our other relationships or carnal relationships. So this includes, I would say, siblings, extended family, friends, colleagues, teammates, acquaintances. 
things like that. Now, some of these relationships can be quite strong. I'm not saying that these relationships can't be strong, but we just have to have our priorities right. Even stronger should be our relationship with God, you know, our, our spouse and our children, and then our spiritual family, and then we have our other carnal relationships. But these relationships can be strong. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So you can see you get a friends, and we, we've all experienced this in life, but you have friends that are closer to you and stick with you even more so than people who may be related to you through blood, right? Now, what are some examples where Christians are neglecting their spiritual family for other carnal relationships? I mean, one, one where I've seen, and I'm just bringing up sort of examples in my own life where I've seen, and I've done it myself as well, so. But say, for example, you, 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 you think you're so spiritual and you just love the lost so much that you, um, you, you're spending too much time preaching the gospel to people. But then, you know, sometimes your, your brother in Christ or your family is like waiting for a lift, you know, and then they're just like sort of neglected while you're loving others so much that you're not taking care of your own family. You're not taking care of, you know, maybe somebody that's depending on you at church. And I've seen that happen. I've done that in my own life as well, where you feel so zealous, but you've got the wrong priorities, right? The priority, the lost do not take a priority to your spiritual family. The lost do not take a priority to your wife and children. You're, the lost do not take a priority to God, right? Well, how can you do that? Where you just you put yourself in bad situations where you say, oh, you know, I'm going to go to this you know, terrible situation, right? It might be at the uh, pub or something like that. People say, yeah, but I'm reaching the lost. Yeah, but you've got to take care of your own spiritual walk first. You know, and take heed that you don't fall. Right? Because the lost is not more important than God. Now, am I saying that reaching the lost is not important? No. But this sermon is all about priorities, right? So, what about family get to extended family get togethers and birthdays and weddings and parties and things like that? Right? So, we've got to be careful that we don't prioritize these other carnal relationships over God and the other things we mentioned before. And certainly so, we need to be careful as well. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. All right, so in closing, what's the priority? God is first, family second, so spouse and children, then your spiritual family. And then, yeah, I would even include like even parents in here because Jesus includes parents in here. Other like, siblings, parents, Extended family, friends, colleagues, teammates, it's all that. Now, why is it important that we prioritize this in this order? Because, like I said, we don't have all the time in the world. And what I want you to understand is, as you go down this list, the amount of commitments that can be in that category just exponentially blow out, right? So there's more things to do that you can commit to with family and even with God, right? There's more things that you can commit to even more so with your spiritual family. What do I mean? That you know more people as these things go down. And then other relationships, I mean, that just grows exponentially as time goes on. There's always going to be a birthday to go to. There's always going to be an anniversary to go to. There's always going to be a birthday party that you have to attend. So how do you decide which ones to do first? Well, if you know what order you should be prioritizing things, that's how you can decide what gets done, and what doesn't get done. All right? Last verse, Joshua 11. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Now, this verse has always spoken to me ever since I heard it preached on, because, uh, you know, what always stands out to me is that Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. But there's probably a lot of things in his life he did leave undone. But you know what he made sure of? He made sure he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. 
He had priorities. He made sure God was first. And he didn't get to everything he wanted to do in his life. But he made sure he left nothing undone that he needed to do for the Lord. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, just thank you for the, the lesson this morning. Lord, help us to set priorities in our life according to how you would want us to have them. Lord, we don't have all the time in the world. Our life is but a vapor. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to manage our time wisely. Help us, Lord, to prioritize the things that are most important to you first, then our family, then our spiritual relationships, and then our carnal relationship. So, Lord, we thank you that you've given us this life that we have. May we use it to serve you and to uh, work for eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.